Desert Places by Robert Frost. So the possible state of themes that could come up in relation to this question um, or this poem are grief and loss. Contextual information surrounding Robert Frost. So this was written in 1936, which is quite late in Frost's life and was obviously after the death of his wife. Um, the poem is evidently based on his own feelings of isolation in rural New England, um, an often cold, lonely experience, as well as based on his battle with depression. The poem explores the realities of ageing and loss, contrasting adult experiences with the carefree pleasures of youth, with a strong focus on solitude, exploring how encounters and community only heighten loneliness and isolation, uh, which is quite a common Frostian theme. It also shows a growing reluctance in the 20s and 30s to launch off on the speculative figmental explorations that a decade or two earlier had animated such brilliant pieces by Frost, such as Mending Wall and Apple After Apple Picking. So it is also a reflection on his work as well. To Untermeyer, Robert Frost actually once confided a very damaging secret, the poet in me died nearly 10 years ago. The calf I was in the 90s, I merely take to market. Take care that you don't get your mouth set to declare the other two books a uh, falling off of par, for that is what they can't be. As you look back, don't you see how a lot of things I have said begin to take meaning from this? I tell you, Lewis, it's all over at 30. Anyway, that was the way I thought I might feel and I took my measures accordingly. I have myself all in a strong box. Um, this concept of having nothing more to say as a poet was what he assumed lay behind Hemingway's decision to commit suicide, and this was a motive and a decision that Frost defended, often having suicidal thoughts himself. Then we have, even worse than having nothing to say perhaps, is emotional poverty, feeling used up both by the pain of events in life and by the demands of his art. And he once wrote, poets are so much less sensitive from having overused their sensibilities. Um, men who have to feel for, feed for, feel for a living would unavoidably become altogether unfeeling except professionally. The title of the poem and summary. The title has connotations of loneliness and isolation through the use of the noun desert as an adjective to describe the place. The poem concerns a geographical location but is also used to comment on the speaker's emotional condition. The desert place represents his emotional isolation, so the title ends up becoming a metaphor for the spiritual wilderness of the human mind. The vast emptiness of the landscape as a reflection on the narrator's own sense of personal isolation. The narrator is lonely, isolated and identifies with the blank and bleak picture before him. The rhyme, rhythm, structure and form, so lines 1, 2 and 4 rhyme, developing a deeper meaning of the poem, being distant, removed and isolated from others. This is reflected in that 1, 2, 4 rhyme, but that 3 does not, and that it's isolated and left on its own. The 4 quatrain, 4 line stanzas with the rhyme scheme A, B, A, C, C, D, C, etc. Um, and each of the 4 quatrains are representative of a different stage of the speaker's thoughts, so... The first stanza is surface level consideration of his physical world, of his immediate surroundings. Then second stanza, how the landscape reflects him. The penultimate stanza is reflective of his own loneliness. And then finally, the, the final stanza, considering his internal desert places. The rhythm is quite irregular, achieving natural speech rhythms and making the poem sound like the speech of a good storyteller. And this is a favourite technique of Frost's that shows the penetration into truth from a common phenomenon. Symbolism. So the trees delineate borders in Frost's poetry. They not only mark boundaries on earth, such as that between a pasture and a forest, but also the boundaries between earth and heaven. In some poems, such as After Apple Picking and Birches, trees are the link between earth or humanity and the sky or the divine. They function as boundary spaces where moments of connection or revelation become possible, where humans can observe and think critically about humanity and the divine under the shade of these trees or standing nearby inside the tree's boundary space. Forests and edges of forests function similarly as boundary spaces, as in Into My Own, which was published in 1915, or Desert Places. 
Finally, trees act as boundaries or borders between different areas or types of experiences. When frost speakers and subjects are near the edge of a forest, wandering in a forest or climbing a tree, they exist in liminal spaces, halfway between the earth and the sky, allowing the speaker to engage with nature and experience moments of revelation. Tone. So the tone here starts off quite solemn and meditative in the first stanza, which is obviously reflective as he considers and ponders his current emotional state or his emotional well-being. The second stanza shows a shift to a quite melancholy tone as he considers how the animals, and indeed he, feels stifled. There is actually almost an apathetic tone generated in the line too absent-spirited to count. And the third stanza shows him being overtaken by darkness in a state of pitiful intellectual or moral ignorance. And in, it's quite defiant in places in the final stanza, especially when he considers what does and does not scare him. However, it ends with this kind of sombre, tragic air. Narrative point of view. So this is a first person narrative written in the present tense to give a sense of urgency or immediacy to his reflection on his emotional well-being and existential anxiety. Um, it is a self-reflective poem as the speaker travels through the falling snow at nightfall. Upon seeing a barren landscape, he reflects on his own sense of spiritual emptiness. However, unlike some of Frost's free previous poems, nothing here in this environment is welcoming or beckons him. Instead of some sort of relaxing oblivion, he's faced with this concrete blankness that he actually seems to identify with. And the blankness offers him no escape, only a reminder of a hostile and unwelcoming self, suggesting inner turmoil and alienation even from himself. And now let's look at poetic techniques, including imagery, um, symbolism and sound. So snow falling and night falling fast oh fast, and a field I looked into going past, and the ground almost covered smooth and snow, but a few weeds and stubble showing last. Um, the f the repetition of falling represents his rapid determination. Um, s the snow represents how he is overcome by grief, how he is fading and his emotional state is faltering. We have the pathetic fallacy of night, emphasising the deadness or stillness of the landscape, um, and it also represents the deadness or stillness of the, the speaker. Then fast, oh fast, the repetition and caesura here creates a quick pace and a sense of urgency. Uh, the alliterative F sounds audibly emphasise the harsh landscape and specifically the crisp coldness of the air. The, the choice of diction covered emphasises the overwhelming isolation of the landscape and indeed the speaker. Then we have smooth and snow, the sibilance emphasises the soft stillness of the snow falling. Um, the few weeds, the little opposition to an all-powerful force crushing all within its path. Um, so nature is viewed as quite destructive here. Then we have the sibilance of stubble showing, emphasising that the snow will cover everything until it no longer resembles the self it once was, once was which could possibly be some sort of metaphor for how grief is all-encompassing and destructive. There's also this antithesis between snow and night that immediately creates a setting that makes the narrator feel uneasy and incredibly unwelcome in this environment. Then if we look at the woods around it have it, it is theirs, all animals are smothered in their lairs, I am too absent-spirited to count, the loneliness includes me unawares. The, the woods are something dark and forbidding and they always have this kind of connotation in frosty and poetry. I mean, if you look at stopping by woods on a snowy evening, it's similar except those woods beckon him, whereas this one alienates him. Then we have the repetition of it and the sejura heightening this feeling of loneliness and we're assuming um, that the it that he's talking about is loneliness itself. Um, there's the personification of the woods, emphasising his loneliness or isolation. His only company in the isolating rural environment is the forest. Um, then we have the alliteration, all animals are. And it emphasises how inhospitable this landscape really is. The verb choice smothered emphasises how unwelcoming or uninviting the landscape is. And then lairs is a reference to the animal 
the animals' homes, but their homes don't offer any security. Relating to the final two lines, where he seems to feel as if he has no place within himself, as he cannot retreat to a safe place by himself, even internally. Um, absent spirited to Kunk, there's a reference to his depression and melancholy through the compound adjective, and then the landscape, the snow, and what it represents are suffocating his spirit. The landscape has numbed and reduced his sensibility, and there's this blank nothingness that mirrors what he is feeling. The loneliness includes me unawares, and again you've got the personification of loneliness here. Um, the choice of diction includes, connotes how he feels overwhelmed by the enveloping feeling of loneliness. The personification creates a sense of isolation and anxiety. It comes about without realising as he is reflecting on his own emotional state and he is included in the loneliness of the landscape. And this final line in this section is iambic pentameter, ending with a polysyllabic rhyme, dramatising Frost's understanding that man is this lonely figure in a dark and comfortless universe, which, if it's not exactly hostile, is nevertheless entirely indifferent to him. And we can also see throughout the section that the pace is quite slow, reflecting how he is slowly being enveloped by his grief or thoughts, like the landscape is by the snow. Then we have, and lonely as it is, that loneliness will be more lonely ere it will be less. A blanker whiteness of benighted snow with no expression, nothing to express. The repetition and parallelism of lonely and loneliness reinforces the weight of the loneliness that he feels and it is oppressive and heavy, weighing on his mind. In this third stanza, loneliness stands in opposition to snow, and opposition is the positioning of things side by side or close together. Um, just as the snow will cover more and more, leaving nothing uncovered, so the loneliness will become still more lonely and unrelieved. Uh, we have the repetition of will be, uh, the juxtaposition of more and less, and the consonants in the L sounds lonely, will, less creating an echoing sound of the silent woods and exaggerating just how alone he truly is. We have the comparative blanker whiteness of benighted snow. So the comparative blanker acts as a metaphor for the indifference of the natural world to human aspirations and emotions. The alliteration blanker and benighted represents how he feels emotionally and spiritually bereft or desolate. He feels destitute, cold and expressionless. And then benighted is quite interesting because there's the contrast of the whiteness of the snow with the darkness of the night. Um, he is ignorant mentally and he is spiritually empty as well. There's also a bit of a pun as night is falling on the snow now, as benighted means taken over by darkness. There is also the enjambment that throughout this that strives to emphasise his reflective musings, generating this bleak tone as he considers how he has nothing to express. He's apathetic entirely. Um, and then the parallelism of no expression, nothing to express. His grief and isolation will prevent him from expressing his emotions. And you can see how that really links to what he said to Untermeyer earlier. Then if we look at they cannot scare me with their empty spaces between stars on stars where no human race is. Uh, we can see that the distancing pronouns there versus me emphasise his isolation from others. The word choice empty spaces emphasise the blank lonely landscape highlighting his depression. Um, the stars on stars, the vast emptiness of the space makes him feel even more alone emphasised through the repetition of stars and there's this kind of internal loneliness, societal loneliness and finally cosmic loneliness that he is completely alone no matter where he turns to. Then we have I have it in me so much nearer our home and there's the personal pronoun showing a kind of determination and defiance um, and nearer our home it is not this real physical desert place or a metaphysical void that the narrator fears but actually a world that he has created in his own mind. He's afraid of himself and his emotional state, the empty blank spaces within himself. Then we have to scare myself with my own desert places. Scare myself, a colloquial term, there's the personal pronoun further heightening his loneliness. 
And the further use of personal pronoun emphasises just how isolated he is when he says my own. Um, desert has connotations of being barren, empty, without life, um, reflective of his spirit. He's more afraid of the desert places within than those without and how we can form a vacuum around us whilst we still have a vacuum inside. And there's a sense that this poem is a nihilistic in a way, um, that his consideration of emotional death or of physical is really represented here. There's a tonal shift. He moves to a much more defiant tone here. It's possibly false bravado. His internal struggle with depression and loneliness ensures he faces these external issues. His own inner demons are much more constricting than anything else that he may have to experience at somebody else's hands. The sounds, so there's quite a lot of assonance going on here. Um, almost all of the assonants are either long vowels or diphthongs, creating a heavy sound that reflects the speaker's serious, reflective mood. Then if you look at the consonants, the D sounds create a sense of hastiness. The speaker wants to find the unknown answers as soon as possible. The S and Z sounds create a heaviness, revealing that it's quite difficult to find the truth during such a desperate journey. Then there's the alliteration. The F sounds emphasise the coldness of the weather and remind us of the blankness of the universe, the loneliness of the speaker. And the sibilant S sounds emphasise the lonely and desperate mood of the speaker. Uh, a really important thing to do to finish this off would be to go and read Seamus Heaney's commentary on desert places. I think it's incredibly useful because you are supposed to consider Heaney and Frost and the similarities and differences in their work. So actually reading what Heaney, your comparative poet, has to say about this poem will be incredibly useful for you.